Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. Andrew Basevich, a retired Army colonel who fought in Vietnam, and Danny Sherson, a retired Army major who did tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, have just published Paths of Dissent, Soldiers Speak Out Against America's Misguided Wars. Basevich and Surgeon West Point graduates, like many writers in the book, come out of the military culture. They began as true believers, embracing the myths of American goodness and virtue and the military honor code pounded into them as young cadets at the military academy. The reality of combat, as it has for generations, exposed the lies told by the generals and politicians. We are not a good and virtuous nation. God does not bless us above other nations. Victory is not assured. War is not noble and uplifting. The clash between the reality of combat and the disnified version of combat consumed by the public, one that propels many young men and women into war, creates not only dissonance and moral injury, but an existential crisis. An existential crisis combat veterans, at least those who are self-reflective, must cope with for the rest of their lives. Joining me to discuss the themes in the book, Paths of Dissent, Soldiers Speak Out Against America's Misguided Wars, is Andrew Basevich. Uh, So at the introduction of this book, uh, these are a series of essays, many of them incredibly powerful, uh, you write that the book offers insights into how and why recent U.S. military efforts have gone so badly astray, flagrant malpractice by those at the top, inflicted untold damage on the troops we ostensibly esteem, on populations U.S. policymakers vowed to liberate, and ultimately on our own democracy, the adverse effects of war are by no means confined to the immediate arena in which fighting occurs um, but I want to ask you, isn't this true from Philoctetes to Eusarian? Isn't this the old story of war? I suppose so. Uh, that said, um, you know, we undertook our post-9-11 wars, wars of choice, we should emphasize, uh, at, a, at a moment when our political leaders insisted, and most Americans, I think, uh, believed, that we had acquired, built uh, the best military force in all of history. Uh, And therefore, we believed, we told ourselves, that military force employed by the United States had a particular utility, effectiveness, with the events of 9-11 providing the basis of then putting force to work. That's what we sought to do after 9-11. And the contributors to this book that uh, Danny and I uh, put together were among those who raised their hands and said, yeah, I volunteer, I'll serve, and therefore experience the consequences. Um, I just before we get into all of the all of the writers in this book are from the current wars. You yourself uh, served in Vietnam, uh, but I just before we get into what they have written, uh, this again is you writing. Uh, you say I concluded that classifying Vietnam as either a mistake or a tragedy amounts to little more than subterfuge. To use those terms is to evade a much deeper and more troubling truth. In fact from its very earliest stages until its mortifying conclusion, America's war in Vietnam was a crime. Uh, Why a crime? Well, let let me acknowledge, first of all, that my own perspective on Vietnam, it's been been a half century since I served there, uh, has evolved over time. And, And at one point, I was certainly a true believer. I don't think that that lasted terribly long. But I think I have come to believe that the dishonesty that provided the context for American intervention 
and the further dishonesty that actually grew, deepened uh, over the course of the conduct of the war was so fundamentally wrong. And the, the absence of voices from within, from, from inside, whether they were policymakers or generals, was so disturbing that in retrospect, I think criminal is the, the, right, the right term to describe the entire enterprise. Would you use the word criminal to describe the enterprises in Iraq and Afghanistan, Libya? Well, first of all, it's important for us to distinguish between those two wars. We tend to lump them together. I think that a case can be made that there was justification for intervention in Afghanistan in the wake of, of the 9-11 attacks. The justification being that it was important for the United States to demonstrate that anyone collaborating with terrorists who were conducting it, who would conduct an attack on us, was going to pay a heavy price. So yes, there was, I think, a, a reasoned political argument for punishing the Taliban. Doesn't follow that there was a reasoned argument for staying there for 20 years and trying to rebuild the place. So it became a criminal undertaking. Iraq case is different. Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with uh, with 9/11. Uh, I firmly believe that the Iraq War stemmed from uh, the intentions of the George W. Bush administration to embark upon a preposterous effort uh, to re to remake the entire Greater Middle East. So it was deeply flawed from the outset. I think it was illegal. And yes, it was a criminal undertaking. So the first essay is by Eric uh, Edstrom, who also went to West Point, wrote a very good book uh, that I read. Uh, and just a couple points he makes in his essay I want to ask you about. Uh, he writes, military indoctrination is the voluntary surrender of one's own identity to join a profession that often takes away the human dignity of others by force. Through repetition, service members have their values, behaviors, and identity recalibrated with the ultimate aim of making them willing to kill or be killed in political violence without thinking about it too much. It is the construction of blind faith in the state and the deconstruction of any critical thinking that could stand in opposition to the state's aims. He went to West Point. You went to West Point. Is that a correct assessment of what you are taught, or we can use the term indoctrination, what you are fed at West Point? Yeah, I, he states it more sharply than I think I would. You just use the term indoctrination. I think I, I prefer to use the term socialization. That I'm referring, I'm referring here to, to people who go to the service academies, not people who enlist in the Marine Corps and go to boot camp or enlist in the Navy and, and you know, learn the skills of a sailor. But my experience at West Point uh, exposed me to a very sophisticated and tested program of bringing of imparting a very particular worldview to me and to my classmates, to all of us, collectively and individually. And the worldview centered on the sacredness of the United States, constitutional order, centered on the belief that the United States Army was the most important institution in the United States that the well-being of the republic, the survival of the republic, rested on whether or not that army was properly supported and whether it did its job. So I left, I think we all left, deeply imbued with that, that, that way of thinking. Uh, and you know, when you, when you undergo that process beginning at age 17, it sticks. 
And I think it took a long time for me, probably it really took until after I got out of the army 20 some years later, to begin to distance myself from those notions, to think critically about those notions, to achieve some amount of intellectual uh, independence. And uh, I think my learning process testifies to how comprehensive and persuasive that process of socialization can be. Eric writes about uh, visiting a close friend who had been seriously injured by an IED in Afghanistan. He arrives in the intensive care burn unit in San Antonio. Uh, this is, he's six foot four, is mummified. He writes in gauze. Only the portion of his body needed for intravenous tubes were exposed. Uh, parts of his face raw and marbled as if a psychopath had flayed him with a cheese slicer and then worked him over with a blowtorch. Uh, ears and nose were charred black. Stiff breeze would have made them crumble to dust. Lips were split, covered in greasy ointment. Uh, and, and that's a very important moment for him. Uh, and I wondered if uh, it had a parallel. When I covered the war in El Salvador, uh, the first photographer uh, who I knew who was killed uh, suddenly changed the whole nature of war for me. And I think that's what Eric in many ways is saying. But I wonder if you could speak to that experience. Well, mine was different. Uh, it was, I think, the beginning of my junior year at West Point. And my best friend from high school, he would become my brother-in-law, he's my, my wife's brother, dropped out of college, enlisted in the Marine Corps, deployed to Vietnam, and within a month of arriving in country, stepped on a mine and blew his leg off. Uh, and and uh, there began a journey of decline uh, that was destined to go on for quite some time. And I remember asking if I could, he, he was, he was uh, sent to the Philadelphia Naval Hospital. And I asked for emergency leave so I could go visit him. Uh, and, and they allowed me to go, and I did. So I was able to at least reassure myself that he was still alive. But that was a moment of awakening. Although, you know, I was still undergoing that process of socialization. So I don't know that that moment, as powerful as it was, really had the, the impact that it would have were I, at that time, living in a somewhat different environment. But yeah, I remember that. Eric also writes about how, he said, in the decade following graduation, the number of my friends injured or killed crossed into the double digits kept going. Some were shot to death. Others were blown up. One died in a helicopter crash. A couple committed suicide. Many more were maimed and horrifically disfigured. Nearly all of us harbored internal demons. I want to ask you about those demons. Well, I, I'm not going to confess to my own. <laughs> uh, so my West Point class, uh, I believe we lost a dozen classmates. I'm, I'm, the numbers may be slightly wrong, but about a dozen killed. Uh, far larger number wounded. Uh, some terribly wounded. Some subsequently suffering uh, from PTSD quite severely. Uh, to include a classmate that I did not know when we were cadets, but who came to be a very close friend after I moved to where we live right now uh, in, in Massachusetts. And my friendship with him taught me, showed me, gave me an appreciation of PTSD. Uh, he had had a terrible tour. Uh, 
as a platoon leader in West Point and carried with that, suffered from that for many years thereafter until through his own courage uh, was able to get his life on track. I mean, the, the, the past was never forgotten. The past never really went away. But through his own courage and determination, he was able to uh, put his life back together. And I think that because of our friendship, uh, I gleaned a, a deeper understanding of how these injuries, moral injuries, uh, in some respects are, you know, I don't want to say worse than the physical injuries, but uh, are comparable uh, in terms of their devastating impact on people. One of the things I think I've become to come to appreciate about our more recent wars is the extent to which, because we, we, we do have a better appreciation now of, of PTSD, uh, of an appreciation of of soldier self-abuse, former soldier self-abuse, suicides, drugs. Uh, we know about that. I, th I think that the country is still insufficiently aware of the afflictions that our veterans bear. Not all, not all, but that, that many veterans bear as a consequence of what they experienced in uniform. And of course, to my mind, what makes it all the more tragic, or perhaps I should say reprehensible, is that the wars themselves are stupid, not worth fighting. I, I want to talk about moral injury. Matthew Ho writes about it, uh, I think, quite eloquently in the book, but it's different from PTSD. Define moral injury. I, do, I, I don't know that I can. Uh, Matthew Ho's essay is spectacularly good, but I, I, and, and so I don't know exactly how he would define it, but I, but I think it is to come away from the experience of war with your, with the, with the moral sensibility that you carried with you from your childhood uh, and into uniform uh, shattered, uh, and therefore left without a moral compass uh, to to guide you. That would be my definition. But again, I'd have to go go look at Matthew's uh, essay in the book to remind myself of how he defined it. Um, one of the writers, Joy uh, Damiana, if I'm pronouncing the correct, so she ends up in the public affairs unit as a army journalist, which is great because I think it just exposes the totalitarian uh, system that the army is. Uh, and the kinds of, she said, you were never allowed to use the word failure in print, never hinted at the possibility uh, that every victory was actually a loss, never even technically lied. Uh, it was a, a propaganda of omission uh, we, the government's very own uniformed journalists, didn't overtly fabricate. We just diligently told only the news deemed appropriate for team spirit. Uh, I mean, the lie of omission is still a lie. Um, but talk about uh, the language that the military uses to describe itself and the uh, kind of inbred censorship inside the military, uh, you know, what it projects outward uh, and and what's happening internally? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that I would single out the military for being uniquely at fault. And it seems to me that institutional journalism, that is to say, journalism produced by institutions for internal consumption, is necessarily an exercise in, in fraudulence, whether we're talking about uh, working for, you know, Coca-Cola uh, or or your local hospital. So so military journalism, I think, very much conforms to to that pattern. 
and therefore the consumer should should be wary of, of what he or she is 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 reading uh it's it's not it's not to be trusted i mean quite frankly we should be wary of what we read in the new york times and the washington post as well uh but but perhaps more so uh when when the news is being created by an institution to serve the needs of the institution although they do fabricate there's an essay by pat tillman's brother uh, and they fabricated completely. He was killed by friendly fire. And, they, and then Jessica Lynch, uh, who becomes a kind of female version of Rambo, is completely untrue. So they will fabricate. Um, there was a passage by Vincent Emmanuel that I found very interesting uh, because it, it sounded more like Vietnam than Iraq. I'm just going to read it and then have you comment. Morale continued to drop during the second deployment in western Iraq. We started smoking weed on patrol and doing coke while setting up observation posts. We'd brought most of the drugs with us when coming over. I remember emptying the first aid kit latched to my flak jacket and filling up the pouch with as much weed as I could. Most of those drugs lasted only the first few months of deployment, though we'd planned to stretch out our supply to the end, but it didn't stay secret for very long that we had good shit with us, and how could we deny anyone the pleasure of getting stoned under the brilliant, unprecedented uh, unprecedented uh, Mesopotamian sky, the deployment turned sour quickly, with several Marines, including some of our commanding officers, killed in the first 72 hours. After that, things went from bad to worse. We shot at noncombatants. We tortured prisoners. We blew up civilian structures. We ran over, mutilated, and took pictures of dead Iraqis, as one headline in Maxim Magazine put it, Al Qaim was the Wild West of Iraq. Uh, frankly, we didn't. We did whatever the f we wanted. Eighteen-year-olds with machine guns, rocket launchers, and a license to kill. Talk about that. Well, first of all, I think that with regard to drug use, uh, I didn't serve in Iraq. I can't testify to uh, what happened in units there. I did serve in Vietnam, and although I didn't use the drugs, uh, there's no question that, particularly in the latter part of the war. Uh, drug use was, you know, everywhere. Uh, a lot of heroin, in particular, uh, in the unit, one particular unit in which I, which I served. Now, with regard to the, the terrible accusations that he wields with regard to his unit and its misconduct. Again, I'm not in a position to judge. I don't. I. I I dare say he is telling the truth as he understands the truth. The only thing I would say is that it is important to recognize that units differ, that the climate within, a un within unit A <clears throat> may well be different from the climate in unit B, and therefore even if we take at face value, I do take at face value, uh, the charges that he is making, I would be very careful about assuming that similar conditions uh, existed in every other unit uh, in the theater. There's an essay that you haven't cited by Budhika Jayahama, who I know pretty well, after his time in the army, he became a professor at the Air Force Academy with a PhD in political science from Northwestern. I mean, an astonishing up from the bootstraps achievement. J-Man, as he is known, served in the 82nd Airborne Division uh, as an enlisted soldier. As an enlisted soldier in a unit that was assigned to conduct uh, nighttime raids targeting so-called high-value targets. I take his testimony as truthful. And what he, what he says is that his unit had, was well-disciplined, had high morale, enlisted soldiers respected their leaders. His dissent, however, and this is why his essay is important, important to the book is that the entire effort was fundamentally misguided because the effect of the effort was to 
was for the Americans to take the war away from the Iraqis. To make it basically an imperial enterprise. We will win the war for you. And what J-Man and his colleagues uh, under, came to understand was, hey, if this thing's going to be won, they've got to win it on their own. My, my point in giving that little anecdote is that we need to be careful not to paint with too broad a brush. I would argue that one of the strengths of this collection is that the perspectives on offer vary widely. We've got, we've got anti-war perspectives, people who basically argue that all war is wrong. We've got anti-Iraq or Afghanistan wars perspectives, people arguing that those wars were ill-advised or, or ill-conducted. So these dissenters, these military dissenters, as we, as we uh, refer to them, came to their perspective the hard way through their own personal experience with war, with military service. And, and in this volume, share with the reader what they experienced, what they learned, what it all means to them. Well, I, I think that's true in every war I've covered. I mean, you, uh, for me, one of the uh, uh, most important elements of a unit, if I was with a combat unit, if they didn't go back and retrieve their dead and their wounded, I immediately got out as fast as I could uh, because it uh, showed a disintegration within that unit, which is something that uh, Victor uh, obviously experienced. So you're right. It does uh, in every war I've covered, but uh, that that was a reality within Iraq I found interesting. He writes at the end that he, he's about to be redeployed. I promised myself that if I were forced to deploy for the third time, I would kill as many of my commanding officers as humanly possible. Fragging was a very real uh, experience in the Vietnam War. I think some people estimate as high as 25 percent of uh, U.S. officers were killed by their own uh, uh, soldiers, if I have that number right. Uh, Matthew Ho, b beautiful essay. Um, I cannot emphasize enough the destructive effects, moral, emotional, and spiritual of moral injury we we're speaking about before. It is believed by many to be the primary driver of combat veteran suicides. It is much more than mere guilt, shame, and regret. What it incorporates but supersedes in its manifestations and symptoms. The deaths of both Iraqis and Americans, the ongoing suffering of the Iraqi people, the anguish of American families bereft of their hoped-for futures were a burden on my soul, and I had not only witnessed the slaughter but taken part in it too. My hands have been covered in blood and brains, fragments of ligament and bone. I was a perpetrator. Uh, and, and that... Uh, and he was. I mean, I love Matthew. I know him and I admire him tremendously. Um, but that, and that's the difference between myself and uh, I never, I had bodyguards, but I never shot anyone. And I think that's a big difference. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt about it. It's a bipartisan effort. This is again, Ho. He said, it soon became apparent the only difference between the Iraq war and the Afghan war is that one had been run by a Republican and the other by a Democrat. Now, you have written to this, uh, but on an issue like war, just like trade deals or anything else, there's really no daylight between the two ruling parties. That's unquestionably true until we get to Donald Trump. <laughs> yes, well, he has, that, that's, he's created his own party. It's, uh, I don't know what we call it. Uh, it's a cult, uh, but certainly among the, the established, you're right, among yes. the establishment. No, no, the, the, there's no question. I mean, with regard to national security, uh, there is a consensus, uh, I think, basically dating from December 7th, 1941, uh, that has only rarely been challenged and has never been toppled. Again, my war was the Vietnam War. I think as that war went badly as opposition and protest uh, grew, there was a challenge to the foreign policy consensus. You know, there was a, uh, 
insistence that there should be no more Vietnams. Uh, and that notion, I think, survived for a brief time uh, after the fall of Saigon. Uh, and yet by the time we get to the presidency of Ronald Reagan, uh, it vanishes. But is, isn't, Andrew, that the difference between Vietnam and the 20 years of warfare in the Middle East is that we did ask questions about ourselves as a nation, as a people that we had not perhaps confronted before in the wake of Vietnam, uh, that there was a kind of reckoning if people like Westmoreland were not necessarily held accountable, they were certainly exposed. And that seems to be completely absent now. I don't fully agree with you, uh, Chris. I mean, in, in my view, uh, we squandered the moment for real accountability about Vietnam. Remember, in 1980, we elect uh, Ronald Reagan president. Well, I'm thinking of the immediate aftermath. You know, what was Saigon, oh, okay. the fall of Saigon was 73. From, from 1975 to 1980, let's say. Yeah, no, it was a brief time period, but it was there. Fair in enough. A way, in a way that it's not there now. Absolutely agree. I mean, what, what we have now is, let's forget about Iraq and Afghanistan. Hey. Let's talk about Ukraine, right? which is the new, quote unquote, good war. Uh, I don't think it is a good war. I think it was an unnecessary, unnecessary war. Uh, but uh, it's amazing to me how quickly the, the scandalous departure from Kabul uh, that occurred uh, early in the Biden administration, which, which touched off a furor uh, of 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 anger within the United States. It's amazing to me how quickly that has, that anger has diminished. And, uh, you know, the, the establishment has moved on. Quite frankly, the media has moved on. Great. I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team, Cameron Granadino, Adam Coley, Dwayne Gladden, and Kayla Rivera. You can find me at chrisedges.substack.com. 